Hello and welcome to another TRPA Lake Tahoe Environment Report. I am Jeff Cowan, Public Information Officer for the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. And we bring this show to you to try and keep you up to date and informed about Lake Tahoe environment issues and also what TRPA is doing to try and help manage the basin and make it a healthier, better place to live. Um, I'm very lucky to be joined today by Megan Sheline. Megan is the forester for TRPA. Hello, Megan. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You're very, yeah, no, thanks for coming. Um, and one of the things we wanted to talk about forest health fuel reduction and wildfire threat reduction management is because the Rim Fire um, to the west of Lake Tahoe um, uh, burned a lot of this summer and has caused a lot of smoke impacts, but it's really got a lot of people, I think, thinking about forest health, thinking about wildfire threat and defensible space. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to ask you on the show today, but thanks a lot for coming. Okay. okay. Um, so uh, to get started, do you know much about the Rim Fire and what, it, what kind of damage it caused? Um, yeah, I believe it's the largest wildfire in California history. If not the largest, it's pretty close. Um, yeah. I think so far it's burned 256,000 acres, um, which is That's a lot of... That's significant. That's absolutely unbelievable. Acres. Yeah. And, uh, you know, smoke uh, was in the Tahoe Basin a lot of the summer, um, but definitely down here in, uh, in Carson Valley where we're filming today, um, uh, there was a lot more smoke and uh, the health impacts were, were, were pretty devastating, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah, I think it was pretty bad. Um, although one thing I was grateful for was that it was not a fire in our own Right. ecosystem, um, despite the fact that we were having to deal with all the impacts. Right. And so that, there was always something to be glad for. And that, and that definitely brings up the fact that um, Lake Tahoe did have a significant wildfire in 2007, the Angora wildfire. Uh, do you remember how many acres that was? A uh, few thousand. A few thousand acres. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was 250 homes burned. Yep. Uh, or 250 structures burned in that fire. Mm -hmm. um, that, the, that event, that wildfire event was sort of a catalyst, I think, for a lot of the fuel reduction work and the wildfire and the, the forest management um, stuff that's taking place in the basin um, lately. What does TRP do? What is its role essentially in managing the forests? Well, TRPA is a big part of the environmental improvement program. And so we work with um, agencies and land managers in the basin to implement defensible space projects and fuel reduction projects, um, whether that's the forest service or state land agencies um, and also the fire districts implement a lot of fuel reduction projects on private land um, kind of as a cost share program with private landowners. Oh really? Mm -hmm. That's cool. So um, I so about 90 percent of the land in the basin is publicly owned right now about 10 percent is private but that 90 percent that's a significant part of the basin. Um, is. Uh, is, is the Forest Service manage most of that? They do. Uh -huh. um, they are the largest landowner in the basin. What's their, do they have a big project going on right now? Yeah, they have a project called the South Shore Project. Um, I believe it's 68,000 acres or somewhere thereabouts. Yeah. Um, to treat a lot of the public land surrounding neighborhoods in South Lake Tahoe and the South Shore region of the basin. So what, what, what do they do when, when we're talking about like treating the forests for wildfire or, or for fuel reduction? What, is it, what, what does that entail? It's essentially a forest thinning project. Um, typically, they thin the small trees out and leave the larger um, overstory trees to remain. Um, but reducing ladder fuels, the smaller trees that could carry a ground fire up into the canopy of the larger trees. Um, and that really helps a fire, in the event of a fire, stay on the ground instead of get up and become a catastrophic wildfire that could really transfer to homes and neighborhoods. And okay, like so it's, I think that's the way I understood it too, is like they have the forest fire can get in the crown of the trees and it can go really fast and far, but if they can get the energy to drop down, yeah. Um, then uh, and then so do they, do they focus on target areas when they when when they treat uh, the forest? I mean, it's not like they go out and they have to treat the entire basin, right? I mean, isn't there kind of like targeted areas where they really need to focus? Yeah, it's called the wildland urban interface, and it's the zone that surrounds neighborhoods, which is pretty much a very large portion of um, neighborhoods in the basin are surrounded by a wildland urban interface. Yeah. Um, and so that's the most important area to treat, um, to get a wildfire to drop down to the ground and become a small creeping ground fire before it gets to the communities. So that, so that makes the forest safer? Yeah, in terms of um, where firefighters could fight the fire and how quickly they could put it out and how successful they would be. So that, I mean, is the, the forest in the basin, is, is it unhealthy? What, why do we have to do so much work? We do have some pretty unhealthy forests. Um, we've been, as a whole, 
humans uh, suppressing wildfire for the last hundred or so years. Okay. And that's really changed the ecosystem a lot. I know people think that um, not touching the forest is a good thing, but we are managing the forest by putting out wildfires, and that's caused a lot of overgrowth, um, a lot of young trees to come up that would normally be um, burned off by small creeping ground fires. Um, a little tidbit of information, a lot of people think that white firs are non-native oh. and that people planted them after the logging in the 1800s. Okay. Um, but really white fir, um, they just grow really well in the shade. And since we don't have the little creeping ground fires or holes in the canopy from wildfire, um, white fir has just become overrepresented. Because it's, it's got more shade because yeah. the forest is choked. Yeah, and pines have a difficult time regenerating in soil that is not disturbed, like okay. disturbed after a wildfire, and they need sun to regenerate, whereas fir and cedar are pretty good at growing in the shade, so they're the, the ones coming up. Wow, that's really cool. So, that, so uh, but wh white fir isn't the only kind of, is, is, is it considered like a, um, something that's hazardous for fire? Um, more so than other trees? They are considered a little more hazardous for fire. They have limbs that typically remain on the tree all the way to the ground, whereas uh, pines are, we call them self-pruners. They let their lower oh. limbs die off, and it's actually a fire adaptation. Um, so that's why you don't see large Jeffrey pines with limbs near the ground, but mm -hmm. oftentimes firs will have limbs all the way to the ground. They're not as adapted to fire. That's funny, because I remember reading it was in one of um, John... Mir's um, writings about Lake Tahoe is that you could ride all the way through the forest back in the 1800s uh, and you would never, you know, have your hat knocked off by a tree branch. And that yeah, must there were because, no limbs near the ground. Right, because the trees were so old and the forest was mm -hmm. so healthy that everything was taller and, and there were no low, lane, low, low limbs and, and ladder fuels. And are we, yeah. try, are we trying to get back to that forest? Is that what the restoration of the forest means? I think that is an ideal uh, forest in a lot of people's minds. I'm not sure that it's possible because we are part of the environment now. And so I think the way the forest will be has changed a little, but um, we do have remnants of those forests around and they are very cool to see and visit. But, over, but overall, the, I mean, the forest of the basin, it sounds like it's a little bit unhealthy and there's a lot of work going on to try and make it healthier. Yes. Um, we've had a lot of attention lately because of the rim fire on Lake mm -hmm. Tahoe uh, because we have we've have a lot of work going on and there's been a lot of successes through right. the Environmental Improvement Program. Um, do you know how much treatment forest fuels has, has, has happened uh, through the restoration program? Yeah, over 50,000 acres, I think 54,000 since 1997 when the program started has been treated just for fuel reduction, which is a pretty significant uh, amount of acres. That is, but that's a lot of, and that's a lot of work too, because it's not just the Forest Service. I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about the Forest Service, but you mentioned earlier that there's, there's kind of a, a lot of agencies and organizations, there's a mosaic um, working together right. to try and do a lot of other work. So, so, so 54,000 acres is, some of that is fire districts. Mm -hmm. Do we count private property owners in there too? We do, and so you know, if someone has, a, say, an eight acre parcel of land in the middle of a community, um, there's been projects that have treated those for fuel reduction. And so you know, a small project ranging up to a large project. Yeah. It's all counted in there. So I, I think people had, a, there was some misconception uh, years ago about TRPA's position on tree removal and things. Um, uh, do we, I mean, how do we work with, with private property owners? We, we, we'll get into the kind of the permitting later on in the show, but how do we work with private property owners? I mean, do we, do we try and support their ability to remove trees? Um, I think we do. Um, I'm definitely pro forest health, which oftentimes includes tree removal. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, thinning out some of the trees in your yard, especially if it's especially dense, um, it can really help the larger trees uh, survive. They have more resources and more sunlight, and they can be healthy, thriving trees instead of choked, competing trees. So, okay. tree removal is a big part of forest health. Um, you know, people have a real strong attachment, I think, to forests and trees. Oftentimes, almost an emotional attachment as well. Um, when these forest fuel reduction projects go on in public lands, we sometimes hear back from property owners, some say we really support all this great tree removal mm -hmm. because it makes the forest healthier and our community safer. But then we also hear from other people that it seems like it's, very, it's a very dramatic change in the forest, a very drastic change in the forest. Um, do, you, do you hear any of this out in the field when, as a TRP forester, do you hear people yeah. talking about that? Yeah, I definitely hear both opinions. Um, it is a drastic change. I think that you know, humans have a pretty short lifespan in terms of the forest. Um, forests last 
last often longer than than humans do and so we are just seeing it in a little snippet of time and so yeah. whatever forest we're used to we kind of think that's the way it's always been and so it can be a really drastic change um, but really starting to understand and think about all the things going on in the forest can help um, you know can help make sense as to why we're thinning out the Forest. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen some of the projects, and there's they have to have staging areas. They have to have places where they work, uh, in order to make the project mm -hmm. kind of you know affordable. Um, uh, and, and a lot of but these staging areas, did, did they get restored or they maintained afterwards? Like they after get the project, restored. Um, typically they're reseeded um, and blocked off so that people can't drive and park on them anymore. And um, right after the project, they don't look so good, but hopefully over time they become a more natural mm -hmm. open area. So, so it may take a few years for some of these areas to come back, essentially, for the little bit of greenery to come back on the forest floor. And Yeah, it's a long process, especially in a place like this where we have a really short growing season and vegetation is often not very lush. Mm -hmm. So it can take a little bit of time to, to get them back to the way they were before. Okay. So, there's, so we have a partnership approach, and TRPA's role, um, uh, TRPA's role in the partnership is kind of, how would you, how would you describe it? Um, we support and promote a lot of the projects um, implemented by the fire districts and the agencies. Often there is grant funding that the agencies are using to implement these projects. And so we have a bit of a permitting role. We make sure that all their projects line up with the TRPA code and yeah. the you know, water quality and forest health rules that we have. Yeah, because we don't want more impacts while we're treating right. the forest, right? Right, and you know, typically they do because they're implemented by resource professionals. And so... Um, I guess we play a little bit of a helpful role in helping agencies figure out other rules like California state forestry rules and um, other water quality rules in Nevada and things like that. So okay. kind of shepherd the process a little. Well, that makes sense. So um, we, because, because we got you here um, and you are the tree removal expert, but you also work mostly with property owners through the application and the permit process for tree removal, uh, we wanted to talk to you in the second half of the show about the permit process and homeowners. Uh, but that's pretty amazing. You're saying 54,000 acres have been treated uh, in the last 10 to 15 years, and we're kind of, you know, making the forest a lot safer. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, okay, so I think we're going to be uh, back after a quick break, and we'll talk more about the permit process and how property owners, how, what their role is in making the forest healthier in Lake Tahoe. But it doesn't pay to win you Reach your bed to sweat No man to die Take an answer by Don't know who you are
Hi, welcome back to the TRPA Lake Tahoe Environment Report. I'm Jeff Cowan with the Tahoe Region Planning Agency, joined back again with Megan. Um, we talked in the first half of the show about forest fuel reduction, big scale, basin wide, all these agencies and organizations working together to try and make the forest healthier, reduce fuels, but the property owners play a significant role in this. And um, uh, we have, TRPA has tree removal permit applications that we require for some, for some uh, tree removal. Uh, but um, I was just curious, I just wanted to kind of step back for a minute. How long have you been a forester of TRPA? Um, I've been there for three years today. Three years today? today? My anniversary. All right, yeah. And, and so and how long have you been a forester? Um, I guess since I graduated from college. Really? I won't tell you when that was. Ah, no worries. <laughs> um, <but yeah. laughs> um, so I, as a forester for TRPA, what do you what do? You do? What, is your, what does your job entail kind of day to day? My biggest job in the summer is visiting private properties to evaluate trees and issue tree permits um, when people need to remove trees from their yard. Um, I also work with the fire districts to you know, work on defensible space projects and the larger scale fuel reduction projects and then they have a permitting program too where they can issue permits for defensible space reasons mm -hmm. and so I work with them a lot on those programs. I mean in, in fact I think the, the fire districts and fire agencies they issue a lot more tree removal permits than TRPA. They do as a whole uh -huh. um, across the basin which is great because they're a big help with that. It's a big, it's a big time saving step, um, space saving step for, for property owners. Yeah. A lot of them, their, their permit applications are free. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how much is TRPA's permit uh, tree removal application? Our application is $53. Okay. Um, it's been that much for a while. Right. Um, yeah, it hasn't changed much for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, so when, when you go out to a property, what are you looking for when um, they want to kind of just talk about forest health? Um, I'm looking for spacing of trees, um, ladder fuels, like we talked a little bit about in the, the first section, um, trees that are growing up under other trees. That's not so good for fire because it can transfer a fire up into the canopy and it's also not so good for, for forest health because the trees are overcrowded and you know they're all competing for resources like sunlight and water. And so just general thinning is one thing I'm looking for. Okay. Um, any insects or diseases that uh, have infected the trees um, it's usually good to get out the, the worst trees in order to preserve the health of the remaining ones. Um, I'm looking for damage to structures. Um, sometimes people have trees pretty close to their house and wind up with cracks in their foundation, or um, many people have trees growing right up against their roofs, and so I'm looking for trees like that that are going to either cause future damage or are causing mm -hmm. damage now. So, so trees can be removed for a lot of different reasons. I mean, TRP permits all that, right? Yeah. It's not like, I mean... Uh, do, do you think that there's, there's a misunderstanding sometimes amongst property owners about the permit process and what, and what it means as far as their ability to remove trees? Yeah, I think a lot of people assume that TRPA will not allow them to remove a tree uh, before they find out the reasons to remove trees or um, get a diagnosis on their tree. Right, okay. Yeah. But, I mean, the fire districts do a lot of most of the defensible space removal. So kind of TRPA comes out for other reasons. Yeah, although if you need to do a lot of tree removal on a property, um, sometimes it can be more efficient just to call TRPA because I can also mark trees for defensible space reasons mm -hmm. um, instead of having two agencies out. Although the good thing about having the fire district out is they can help you with defensible space elsewhere on your property. Um, but if it's just about trees, I can um, pretty much cover yeah. all tree needs on your property. Um, and then I think a lot of this stuff that we're going to cover next is in the property owner's guide to tree removal in Lake Tahoe Basin. This uh, brochure is available at fire districts at TRPA, but it's also on our website. We have a new website as well. Uh, TRPA launched a new website that's a lot, a um, uh, little bit easier to use, a little bit um, you know, more modern, and um, has a lot more information about how people can get involved. Now, you created a lot of great fact sheets for property owners as well that are on the website, right? Yeah, there's one here about uh, identifying common tree species in your backyard, like firs and pines and cedars. Okay, and so that would help people a lot. I mean, because they get, get to know a little bit more about the trees in yeah. the forest. And then was there something, those ones on insects? Yeah, insects and diseases. Um, they are all native insects and diseases, so they're not necessarily bad. Um, but it is a good thing to notice in your trees. And like I was talking before about clearing out the worst and retaining the best on your property. Okay. To recognize what's going on. 
Um, so this tree removal guide right here, this is the one that really explains uh, what trees you need a permit for and which ones you don't. Yes. Could you kind of explain that? Yeah, so in general, um, trees greater than 14 inches diameter require a permit. Um, that's about the size of a large dinner plate at uh, chest height off the ground. Okay. Um, you can measure around your tree, and if your tree is 43.9 inches around, that's the same as 14 inches diameter. Okay, got it. Um, that's in this brochure, and it also, um, we've got a little picture showing how to measure a tree. Mm -hmm. So um, you can take that home. Um, and then at Lakefront Properties, we do have some special rules, um, which I guess I won't go into listing them all now. If you have a Lakefront property, right. it's best to just contact us to determine if you need a tree permit. Right, because in, in, uh, in sensitive areas like marshes, meadows, mm -hmm. wetlands, and in, and in the shoreline area, if a tree is only six inches diameter or much smaller, um, it may be very critical for right. forest health, for the health of the watershed, right. things like that. So when then also sometimes trees were required to be planted uh, in front of a shoreline property as mm -hmm. part of a permit in order to kind of screen the property from the lake to right. try and make it um, not, not so highly visible. So you're right. I think property owners generally, if they're in the shoreline or sensitive areas, they should really call. But this information on the website, which is www.trpa.org, um, that information is really helpful. Now, now how, do they, how do they contact you if they just wanted to give you a call? Um, you can call 775-588-4547. And in the main menu, if you press extension 8, that will take you to the tree phone line. And then trpa.org has all of this stuff. Um, are there any outbreaks of disease in the basin that are kind of topical right now? There's kind of a big one going on in the Al Tahoe neighborhood okay. of South Lake Tahoe. Um, it's the first outbreak of the Jeffrey Pine needle miner since the 70s that the Forest Service has on record in California. Um, and it is a native insect that kind of attacks the the middle section of the needle in the Jeffrey Pines, and so it gives them this kind of overall orange appearance because the top half or the end half of the needle dies. Okay. Um, so it can look like your tree's dying, but chances are the trees will recover. Um, the only problem is it kind of predisposes them to other problems like other insect attack, which can kill the tree, but unlikely for these trees to die. Um, but if you drive around that neighborhood, you'll see a lot of the trees kind of have this orange halo. Okay. Uh, and so the Alta is the old, that. is one of the older neighborhoods in South Shore. It is. In the and it's, town. Yeah, and it's pretty much just a Jeffrey Pine forest. Not okay. a lot of other tree species in there. Um, and it's, it's flat and close to the lake, which I think is um, a more likely place for this to happen. Okay. But property owners don't need to necessarily do anything. They just need to be, maybe be aware that that's happening to the trees in their neighborhood. Yeah. The one thing that they could do is if their lot is really overgrown with lots of trees, um, they should probably thin it out and keep some big, good, nice trees instead of um, having a lot of trees that are struggling and limping along. It would okay. prolong the lives of the bigger, healthy trees if they did remove some of the, the more crowded trees. That's the case. So, I mean, defensible space is the big thing that property owners can do, private property owners can do, to try and make the community safer, make the forest healthier. But mm -hmm. um, uh, how, do they, how does the, um, uh, the permit process go most of the time when a property owner comes in? Uh, like, how long does it take to get um, uh, their tree removal permitted? Um, from TRPA? Um, I visit most properties within less than a week of receiving a tree removal application. A lot of people just call me directly and if I'm going to meet with them on the property, uh, I accept applications and the filing fee on site and so it's pretty streamlined and really easy. Um, they don't need to come into the office in advance and if they choose to be on site, they can just meet me then. That sounds pretty helpful. Sounds like you're making it kind of easy to do this, right? I hope so. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> That's the goal. Um, there's about 43,000 private properties in the basin. I mean, that's a pretty significant amount. That's a lot of work. Um, but you don't have to go out to every one of these properties because so much of the defensible space stuff is permitted by the fire protection districts. Is that, that right? That is true. Okay. And um, with the increase in the diameter limit after the Angora fire of trees that can be removed without a permit, it went so, from, so 14 it went from inches. 6 inches okay. to 14. Yeah. Um, you can really do a lot of your defensible space without even needing a permit. Okay. Um, because really defensible space near homes is a lot of ladder fuel removal, which is um, removing the trees that are small and growing up under the trees. So if you're just looking to do some defensible space, you can probably get started on your own. Okay. And if you 
find that you need a tree permit, you can call the fire district or TRPA. Okay. Uh, but I, I know that uh, tree removal, vegetation management, is sometimes a little bit expensive. Um, uh, I've been telling property owners for, for years when it comes to storm water, best management practices, and even defensible space, it's something you want to kind of map out, you know, a multi-year plan and kind of, you know, think about saving some, putting a little bit of money away here and there because um, it, it can be significantly expensive. Do you, do you think that... Um, the rim fire has kind of maybe uh, gotten people a little bit more engaged and active on defensible space this year, or is it going to take some time? I hope that it reminds people that we live in a wildland where this could happen and hopefully motivates them to maintain their defensible space because it's not a one-time thing. And so even if you did your defensible space last year or a couple years ago, it's an ongoing process. And so I think it's a good reminder. Okay. Um, to increase our safety here too. And there's, and there's a lot of little things people can do as well. I know that pine needles has always been um, a major topic for uh, fire and defensible space in the basin. Um, can you tell me what is TRP's stance on pine needles? Yeah, we, um, we agree that pine needles should be raked in the spring. Um, and then as they fall off the tree over time, um, it's okay to leave a little layer of them, um, but they should be definitely raked up once a year out to 30 feet at least, or the property line. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's a pretty big band, yeah. 30 feet from a structure. Yeah, and a big change also was um, it's okay to have gravel on all sides of your house now, not just on the side where the drip lines fall. Okay. Um, and so that's for fire safety as well. You shouldn't have pine needles up against the house. So that's that. And then I think what you're talking about is the five-foot zone yep. where there's nothing can burn. Is that is that the defensible space practice that's... Yeah, it's um, you shouldn't have anything combustible in that area. Okay. So pine needles should not be in that zone. Right, okay, so TRPA definitely agrees, and the fire districts agree. Yep. We're all on the same page with that one. Yeah, with we the got pine that needles. worked out. And pine needles on roofs. Um, they should be removed. They should be removed, okay. <laughs> they can be removed all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah at any time and all the time, mm -hmm. especially well, this, in gutters and yeah. the valleys of the roof. This time of year, it gets to be quite uh, quite an issue, having to go out yeah. and run out and rake up all the time. Yeah. But um, the... Rake them once in the spring, let them fall in the fall. That, that, is, that applies to areas of bare soil. Yes. Like, you know, if you have turf grass or an area that um, has mulch on it already, right. you can rake that as much as you want. You, don't, you, yeah. you, you can normally rake more than once a year. You can rake as often as you want to try and keep those yeah. fuels down yeah. to, keep, to, to try and help re reduce that. Yeah, and so the purpose of letting them fall in the fall is uh, just having a little bit of a layer to protect bare soil from erosion okay. without really building up a large layer of material that could be a fire hazard. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, one more time before we go, Megan, okay. what is the phone number where people can reach you? It is 775-588-4547 and extension 8 if you need to talk about trees. And so www.trpa.org is the new website and you will find a lot of information that Megan's helped develop, tree removal guide for the property owners, as well as uh, insect and disease fact sheets and, and how, to, um, uh, how to identify the trees of the basin. So a lot of really good information, Megan. Thank you so much for coming down. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right, and good luck out there. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time.